so welcome everyone, and uh, let's uh, take a look uh, inside game design and uh, neuroscience. So start with a little bit about me and my company. Um, my company, Media Res, uh, uh, for about the last five years, we've been working on taking what works in video games to be engaging uh, and translating that for health benefits, especially to uh, medication adherence and treatment adherence. We're working on projects for relapse prevention, behavior change, resilience, diagnostics, adherence. We have a number of uh, uh, exciting partners in this. And uh, here's a little bit about me. I spent over 20 years making video games. Here are some of my clients. You might know some of these, some of my clients and publishers. <coughs> Here are some of the games I made. You might know some of these too. Um, and uh, so let's start with a little audience participation. So who thinks video games cause violence? Hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up, thank you. Who thinks video games cause obesity, sedentary lifestyles? Hands up, hands up, hands up. Uh, games cause addiction? Hands up, hands up, hands up. Lots of people, okay. All right. <coughs> Who thinks that games are inherently dangerous, harmful, or bad? Come on, be honest. I know this. All right, two, Th three, three, maybe two and a half. Who thinks the potential benefits of video games outweigh potential harms? Ah, the biggest hand, uh, the biggest hand so far. And who thinks the harms of video games are overblown right now? Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to uh, quote uh, Dr. Isabella Granick, uh, who said the vast majority of psychological research on the effects of gaming has been focused on its negative impact. It's, and it's likely this focus will not diminish in the near future, in part because of enormous media attention from things like shooting and simply because if it bleeds, it leads. It's more exciting to write about negative, d dangerous, damaging stuff to make people afraid than talk about the uh, potentially more interesting good stuff. So what are the ethical implications of, of this kind of unbalanced approach? Uh, so whenever a compelling and popular new medium appears in culture, it's often greeted by accusations of causing societal ills and being addictive. Uh, and video games, of course, are the, the compelling and popular new medium right now. Uh, so let's take a look at some other things that have been accused of causing societal ills and being addictive. Uh, how about music? How about the novel? How about plays? How about comic books? How about dance? Uh, the waltz was, uh, was accused of, of being one of the most horrible things that had ever uh, been perpetrated on people and would turn all our women into, uh, so, uh, uh, and these um, concerns about addiction uh, and, and societal ills are usually aimed at the, uh, the weak and vulnerable and the unprotected and the not very smart, so usually children and women uh, in society and uh, uh, by the, uh, the moral keepers. So um, uh, music has been accused of, of making people into kind of mindless zombies who are addicted to, to dance, especially black music. And, uh, music from, uh, you know, the, from non-acceptable sources. So uh, let's take a look at, uh, at one of these. Uh, so of course, none of these have been proved to be uh, actually uh, addicting, and the social ills have been uh, typically proven to be overblown. Uh, so uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, Wonder Woman and consider the poster child for moral panic research, a guy named Dr. Frederick Wortham. Uh, he's literally the poster child for creating moral panics. He's using a poster to create moral panic. He testified before Congress that video games were the cause of juvenile delinquency, which was a big problem in the 50s, that uh, kids became addicted to them, and then they went out and committed crimes and became gay. And uh, so everyone burned their comic books, and uh, comic books uh, laws were passed against selling comics, and there was jail time, and, uh, uh, and what happened was the American comic book industry was decimated. And what we now know happened is that um, instead of making children read only good material from then on, lots of kids who stopped reading for pleasure entirely because what they read for pleasure were comic books. And comic books were actually the, the gateway drug to actual, to reading better literature. Uh, so um, this actually, this ban actually proved highly counterproductive for society once the comic book industry was destroyed and only kind of slowly made a comeback. Now, comic books are considered art forms in Japan and Europe where they were allowed to develop unmolested, but in the US that wasn't the case. Uh, and then what do we find out? Uh, just recently, we a woman looked into uh, Dr. Wortham's research and found out that his, he was methodologically completely fraud and lied about a lot of things, that uh, his research was, um, did not apparently hold up to actual scrutiny. So where does that leave us now? Well, uh, we, we see the same thing happening with video games now. Uh, and uh, uh, so one thing you want to do as a researcher is not get name checked by the US Supreme Court uh, which actually did name one researcher in particular, and I won't, won't uh, 
uh, add to the embarrassment by repeating his name here, but this is what they said about his work and the work of people like him. These studies have been rejected by every court to consider them, and with good reason. They do not prove that violent video games cause minors to act aggressively. Uh, uh, nearly all the research is based on correlation, not evidence of causation, and most of the studies suffer from significant admitted flaws, flaws in methodology. So, uh, so where are we with, uh, with video games? Um, by focusing so much on the negative, we end up with unbalanced research, poor results, and most important, I think, wasted opportunities when, when the research is so overwhelmingly focused on trying to find something negative. Now, I'm not saying don't find problems. Definitely look for problematic issues with anything, including video games. But as a result of this unbalanced focus, are we really looking at uh, what could be actual uh, incredibly strong benefits of video games? Uh, we're finding that video games uh, can be extremely effective in things like uh, combating phobias and, and actually doing pain control without drugs, which I'll get into a little bit later. This is, uh, apart from a few researches, is going largely unstudied. So uh, w because the media drools over moral panic research and often yawns when research shows otherwise, uh, there are problems. So I think that, that the ethics of video games kind of cut two ways. We need to not only look at the ethics of what video games produce in society, but what are the ethical implications when we concentrate resources on a presumption that stuff kids like is always bad, which uh, seems to be happening again. And I'm not saying all researchers are doing it for that purpose, but uh, it is a trend I'm noticing. I'd like to quote our colleague on the panel, Dr. Mark, Mark Griffith, who says, most of the reported effects of video games appear to center on the alleged negative consequences, but there are many references to the positive effects of video games. So let's think about this for a minute. One thing that most people accept now is that video games are very good at having educational benefit. And I would like to suggest a couple of reasons why this may be true. That there's passive learning and active learning, and the further down on the pyramid you go, the better, the, 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 the more effective the education is, and practice by doing is very effective, and video games are all about doing. Video games are experiential learning. They map almost directly to experiential learning model. Uh, and I'd like to, I'll give you a little anecdote of my own. I worked on a game called Lord of the Rings Online, and uh, we would create massive books worth of how, what the game is about and how you play it and what goes on in it. But what we would find is that uh, the, the players knew more about the game than I did. You know, the players knew more about the game than the creators did because they get into it from inside. They experience it from inside. They have experiential learning about the game world. And so these books are kind of uh, secondary to their knowledge of it that it's much better, and, and they learn a lot more uh, than if they sat down and read the book. They would learn a lot more simply by going into the game world and experiencing it. This is a shot from the game world. Uh, gameplay also tracks the scientific method pretty, pretty directly. When you play a game, you confront something that's unknown. Uh, you take action on it. You observe the responses. You form a hypothesis about what happens. Uh, you know, if Pac-Man moves this way, oh, the ghost ate me, well, now I have to run from the ghost. Oh, now I turned into something, the ghost run from me, now I can eat the ghost. You, and you don't know this starting, it doesn't give you rules, you just go in and play it. And you test that hypothesis you form, and then you validate your hypothesis or revise it, and then you repeat. It's exactly the scientific method. So people, uh, children, are learning a lot from video games. The problem is, uh, is what we're giving them in video games something that's really worth learning. So let's talk about the changes in the brain when we learn. And this is just general learning. Uh, there's a great study about what really uh, produces learning, and that's practice and emotion. And the emotion part was surprising to me because I didn't really understand this, but the more I studied it, the more it makes sense. Of course, practice, uh, everyone understands. Your biochemical pathways uh, have neurons that, that grow and reach out to each other when they're activated along the lines of what you're, what you're participating with. What, and so you learn that way. But the emotion part's what's really fascinating. Uh, you build, uh, building networks of neurons requires more than just practice, uh, but when we're awash in emotion chemicals, the synapse strength and responsiveness of neuron networks is dramatically changed. Uh, these emotions like adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin uh, greatly enhance learning. Now, uh, and here's a picture of that for you because I, I, I decided I'd put something in that makes me look scientific. <laughs> so uh, this is a face of someone playing a video game. Uh, and now um, gamers are accused of having kind of a blank, dead, non-emotional uh, connection with the game. This is, could not be further from the truth. This is what really goes on in the game. This is a face of learning. This is a face of practice plus emotion. Here's another one. Here's another whoop, went a little fast. There's another one. There's another one. These are real faces of people actively engaged in video games. I think he won and she might have lost. Mm. <laughs> 
so uh, in, in, in kind of traditional learning uh, where there's a lecture like I'm doing now, your eyes tend to glaze over because I'm just talking, talking, talking. But gameplay doesn't do this. Gameplay doesn't explain anything. You just, you just explore. You build on your errors. In games, you fail all the time. You fail constantly. But the game is very forgiving of failure. So, you, uh, so it's a much more enjoyable way to learn. It engages the whole brain. And here's another picture to make me look really scientific too. So uh, there's another problem that schools are training kids for a world that no longer really exists uh, using methods that have failed. We're really using kind of an, an industry method of, of education to this day. And um, although a lot of schools are experimenting with new processes, but where is the learning through engagement and discovery? Where do kids really get to participate in, wh in what they're learning with? And, and explore and, and fail and succeed and create things. And, and this is very difficult because the, uh, it requires a very, very uh, connected teachers working with them. Uh, some people believe that if we make video games that are as strong in education as they are in entertainment right now, we would really solve this problem in a way that scales and is very inexpensive to do. So let's take a look at the cognitive benefits of gaming. Uh, so. Um, Contrary to the conventional beliefs that playing video games is intellectually lazy and sedating, it turns out that playing these games promotes a wide range of cognitive skills. This is particularly true of the shooter games that are called action or violent games that are violent in nature. Uh, shooter game players allocate attentional resources much more effectively than people who don't play shooter games. They filter out irrational, uh, irrelevant information much more effectively. And uh, MRI scans show, show this. Um, so we're, we're getting some really interesting beginning research uh, but I think we have a long way to go to find out why these kind of things happen. Um, there's also new research about surgeons, that uh, surgeons who play video games, shooter games, are better than, than surgeons who don't. Uh, so <laughs> there's your violence for you. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about play fighting. It's something that uh, is only tangentially related to video games. But uh, play fighting and social play is essential in childhood. It's essential in non-human animals. Uh, it's a way that... Uh, they work out hierarchy, they work out organization, uh, and uh, play is kind of essential for life in ways that we don't often appreciate. Uh, so let's go beyond just uh, kind of well-established educational benefits of games and cognitive benefits of games, which I'm sure most people have heard of. Let's talk about where research is really headed now, including some of my research now with Media Res. Uh, we're, working, we're looking at games as behavior change and games as interventions. Now here's a couple of games that have already been done. This is Remission. Uh, anyone familiar with this? It's a cancer knowledge uh, uh, game, and it, it, kind of sh it, it is kind of the first steps towards showing that games can help with medication adherence. Uh, so here's some CBT for teen depression, a game called Sparks. It also showed some good results. Pain management, anyone heard of this one, Snow World? Uh, what's happening is that uh, this gentleman has been severely burned over his body, and he has to undergo treatment that involves scraping his flesh. And it's excruciating, and the only thing that previously has been found to be effective are opioids. So we are risking addicting uh, people who uh, often have served in the military, um, which has long been a problem um, because they uh, have excruciating pain beyond what a lot of us know. So there's a virtual reality game called Snow World that a uh, uh, researcher created. And apparently, this is very effective in helping people manage this kind of excruciating pain without drugs or with limited drug use. Now, how is this even possible? Well, the mind is a powerful thing, and uh, the mind uh, can release its own uh, pain control drugs under the, right under the right circumstances with the right stimulus, and this is an example of doing that. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of the phobia research. They, they find that instead of simply using a, uh, a, the drug to control phobias, when they combine that with a kind of virtual world where you get to experience the, uh, the, the stimulus that creates the phobic reaction uh, while taking the drug that inhibits the phobic reaction, people can very quickly overcome that. Another way video games doing those. Anyone heard of Fold It? Um, this is a remarkable project in which video gamers uh, uh, unlocked a, a particularly important protein in uh, AIDS research uh, online by playing video games. This is also the, this kind of crowdsourced video game, I think, is the future, going to be the future of a lot of research. Uh, I'd like to digress for a second to talk about behavior change from gameplay. Long before there were video games, 200, almost 300 years ago, a pretty smart guy talked about how playing games actually doesn't just teach you things that cause the behavior change. The gentleman was Ben Franklin, the only president of the United States who was never president of the United States. <laughs> and he said this, the habit of not being, that what video games cause, 
the behavior change they cause is the habit of not being discouraged by present bad appearances in the state of affairs, the habit of hoping for favorable change, and that of persevering in the search for resources, or as we call it today, resilience, future orientation, and persistence. Franklin said that games not, don't simply teach, the playing chess doesn't teach this, it causes it to happen in you. It causes, two, two minutes, let me rush. Okay, uh, and uh, Franklin also said you must abide by the consequences of your rashness. Now consequences are essential to video games because what video games are about are making choices and facing consequences. Unlike uh, film where you're just watching someone else's consequences. Uh, I'm gonna skip a few slides because I wanna hop right to the adherence problems of conventional health apps. Uh, that a lot of conventional uh, apps for health, uh, they, they start out strong, but then they lose like 90% of users after that. Uh, and a lot of what users say is it's just not engaging for them. So what if we use gameplay to plug that fun back into it? Uh, we're working on some uh, like diabetes games for kids where uh, they get to experience their future and, and experience their success in, in the future. Uh, games for smoking cessation using the same kind of things, using the same kind of uh, video gameplay. Let me see, I'm gonna rush out. We're even doing games for, for assessment to translating animal models. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll finish with this uh, because I think it's important to understand uh, the way that learning really works. Um, babies have been known to drop their focus uh, from stimulus items where the complexity is too low or too high. This is exactly what happens in video games. We design video games where the, com where the complexity is always right at the sweet spot because if it's, if it's, if it's not, uh, if it's too easy, you'll be bored. If it's too hard, you'll be frustrated. We want to be right at the sweet spot in the middle of it. Babies automatically, automatically focus their, their attention on those areas that are just right. They're inherent uh, game designers. Uh, so, oh, you know what? I have one more minute. I'll finish with this. Um, that uh, the, um, uh, the stress response in, in video games is you want uh, U-stress, which is positive cognitive response to stress that's healthy. And when you're playing a video game, when you're in that sweet spot where it's not too boring and not too hard, you are in street, uh, you stress. You have challenge, which you can face. It gives you stress, but then overcoming it causes mastery. And I believe this paradigm is the heart of what are going to be a, a number of uh, interventions for the future that will be very effective for health. And uh, when, we get to, uh, when we get to addiction, I have a couple questions about that, which uh, we'll come back to. So thank you very much. <laughs>